Hello, a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Kostas Shinarakis. As communication officer of DG Rollout, I have the honor to guide you through this event. DG Rollout is an indirect project of the European Union. Our vision is to foster deep geothermal energy as a climate friendly heat resource in Northwest Europe. And by doing so, nurture the region's economics and the well-being of the citizens. To achieve this, we want not only to generate expertise, but also to make it available and provide information for stakeholders and investors of geothermal energy. Therefore, I'm very pleased that so many of you joined our webinar today. I'm also happy to welcome today's speaker, Claire Bosneck from TU Darmstadt. Claire holds a PhD in Geoscience from the University de Lorraine, which was conducted in cooperation with the company Neptune Energy on the topic sandstones in the Upper Rhinegraben. Her research focuses on structural and petrophysical characterization of fault zones and, of course, on the integration in reservoir models for geothermal usage and heat storages. I'm very happy to have you here with us today, Claire. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. I hope everyone hears me well. So, yes. perfect. So today I will give you more insights on how to get more of the district eating network with some geothermal storage options. So this is a presentation that uh, I will present today, but most of the work has been done by me and my colleagues, uh, especially Dr. Welsh, um, Mr. Formals, uh, Mr. Zeib, and uh, under the supervision of Professor Zass. So the project partners for the DGA rollout are numerous, and we are one of them in the Technische Universität Darmstadt. And uh, the goal of the Northwestern North Europe uh, Interact project uh, is to actually give some more insights on uh, the deep geothermal uh, rollout and to give some application. And for this, one of the application is actually how to implement uh, geothermal energy in the district heating network, but also how to solve the issues of how to store uh, excessive heat in, um, in geothermal uh, reservoirs or in uh, with the geothermal options. So a district heating network, first question that we need to answer is what of what elements is uh, this, this district heating network composed of? So you have the district grid with uh, the pipes that are conducting the heat from uh, the producing unit of uh, energy. So you have already an existing infrastructure on the surface. From this uh, structure, you can have waste heat, waste heat when you overproduce, for example, uh, some some heat and uh, it's also very impacted by the energy market so for example if the prices of uh, of uh, oil and gas or uh, non-renewable resources increase then uh, the district heating network will uh, will be affected by this by this uh, this economic uh, fluctuations the problem also of uh, including uh, renewable energy into the into the heat district is that you have a seasonal variability on the demand and production. So, for example, if you want to implement a solar panel uh, in the in the district heating network, you will have a, a different a shift between when the you have the most uh, most production of uh, of solar heat and the moment in time in the year when you have the most demand. So, in summer you have a, a potential of generation that exceeds the demand and in winter you have a demand that exceeds the generation potential and using storage you can actually shift uh, the excess of production of the summer to uh, the surplus heat to, to, to shift it to winter use by storing in between the heat in the subsurface. So uh, an adapted uh, network in which you will uh, integrate renewable energy can be schematized as so. So you have strong interaction between system components because you have to uh, include the component design on the surface. You have to manage the supply and return temperature. 
you can have buffer capacities on the surface and you connect them with uh, your existing infrastructure. Of course, you are dependent on the weather data and on the heat supply <coughs> from, the, from the weather. And also you have a possibility to, to, dis to diminish the fluctuality uh, of, the, of the network, of the heat demand by uh, implementing a subsurface uh, storage, uh, but in which you have to integrate the env environmental interaction. So this leads to a complex system with strong interaction, which requires a dynamic system simulation for the design. We have several options for uh, underground thermal energy storage. You can store uh, the heat in an aquifer with a aquifer TES, so thermal energy storage, in which you can have either cooling or heating, depending on what you, are, you need. You can also have a PET TES, so it's a near surface uh, thermal energy storage. You also have the possibility to store uh, the, the excessive heat in the galleries of mines. And the last one I will focus more about today are the borehole thermal um, energy storage system in which you will uh, inject the heat in the subsurface by using uh, several, uh, several borehole heat exchangers. So how does a, a borehole thermal energy storage system works? You have a series of, of wells that are uh, drilled into the subsurface. And in these wells, you install a borehole heat exchanger, also called uh, BHE, uh, in which uh, you, will, uh, uh, you will have a circulation during summer of the fluid uh, which contains the excess heat into uh, the borehole heat exchanger, and the heat will diffuse into uh, the subsurface uh, during the charge uh, phase during summer. And... Uh, during winter, there is the operation of discharge in which uh, you will uh, also circulate the fluid from the outer period that will warm up uh, at the contact of the of the warm uh, the warm background in the subsurface and come back to the surface to supply the district heating grid with hot fluid. There is a possibility to implement, and it's already uh, quite often the case uh, in several case studies in Europe, uh, of surface BHE network. In such, uh, such designs, you have a lot of, uh, of borehole heat exchanger. Uh, to be efficient, you have to, to, pass, uh, to pass a high number of uh, BHE, so it implies a, uh, quite a big uh, surface on the, of use um, of, the, of the land, and um, you have... Um, you connect them uh, to the surface. This will, of course, have a thermal influence on the, on the aquifer. Uh, with the medium deep borehole heat, heat, heat exchanger, you drill deeper, uh, so you have to, you need less uh, borehole heat exchangers. And as they go deeper and are thermically isolated from the surface aquifer, uh, you reduce the thermal influence of the near surface aquifer, in the near surface aquifer, and uh, you have the possibility to have then less surface occupancy and use a low permeable uh, rock media to be able to, to store the heat in a very conductive uh, heat flow, and uh, you have few losses because the, the convective uh, losses are, are reduced by the minimum flowing of groundwater in such a crystalline, low permeable environment. There were several uh, numerical simulations done on MDBTS designs to, to, de to, de to decide and to give insight on what is the best, uh, best design to, to have and for, uh, precise, uh, for an efficient um, design of this, you need to, to have a quite a, you can reach quite a high storage capacity, and uh, you can have a high utilization rate, rate rates, uh, but for this you need to have a precise, uh, precise drilling, and exactly the, the, the optimum that, uh, that was found by my numerical analysis, that you have to have a wells that are five meters away from each other, and that reach a minimum depth of uh, 700 uh, meter uh, depth, like this, you can reach um, uh, quite a, a good uh, 
a good grade of, of, uh, of use and have an efficient uh, system. To discuss the, the, the reduction of the, the thermal impact on the, on the surface aquifer, uh, a comparison of shallow BHE and medium deep uh, borehole thermal exchanger has been done, and um, this modelization shows that from uh, by using a thermally isolated uh, uh, borehole exchanger system allows the reduction of uh, specific heat loss of more than uh, more than 80 percent, and you also have uh, the impact the impacted aquifer volume that is reduced by 70 percent. So this leads us to a uh, possibility to see, okay, we have made some numerical uh, simulation of, uh, of such, uh, such system, but uh, we need a, a proof of concept study, a demo site to, to, to uh, validate these this, this numerical simulations. And the possibility is that at Campus Darmstadt, uh, the Campus Lichtwiese in Darmstadt, uh, we have a uh, uh, a possibility to implement this uh, this demo site. We actually have a, a ready to use heating and cooling network uh, with heat and power station, uh, uh, heat in uh, wasted heat uh, produced by the data center, and uh, a network in which we can implement such solution to reduce uh, the carbon emissions of uh, of the heating grid. Uh, to see if there, it was feasible to, to transition the campus, uh, the campus eating grid to a solar district uh, implemented uh, eating grid, uh, we implemented some modeling, some co-simulation modeling of, uh, of the network by using uh, the, the heat load on the campus, uh, providing uh, the goals that the university wants to reduce the wants to reduce the, 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 the target, uh, the CO2 emissions to the, to, to the target of, uh, of 2050. And uh, we also implemented the energy prices uh, projected and emission factors projected in the system. Uh, currently, the system is, uh, is alimented by a CHP and uh, we have a, a uh, high potential computer that uh, produces uh, waste heat that can only be used in the return uh, loop. But the goal is to decrease uh, to decrease uh, the, the temperature of uh, of the grid to be able to use directly the the HPC waste uh, directly to to the supply, and also to implement uh, the solar thermal uh, panel and solar thermal. Uh, its grid uh, into, into the network to reduce uh, the CO2 uh, emissions. For this and to use to be able to have uh, as uh, little fluctuation as possible on the heating grid and uh, alimentation of the system, uh, we tested the implementation of borehole exchangers um, at, the de at the depth of 750 meters and with a variability of, uh, of the number of uh, borehole heat exchangers. Of course, then we need to define, because it's in the future, we don't have production data and so on, so we need to define uh, transition stages, transition strategies uh, to, to implement this, this transition uh, to, towards a, a, cleaner, a cleaner grid. Uh, the three strategic transitions are either we stay in the status quo or we switch uh, in the period, uh, in the coming period of 2025-2030, uh, to a reduction of the of the grid supply and uh, a reduction of the grid return temperature, and uh, we we keep uh, the, the HPC cooling power at the same level. Uh, another the, the next stage would be that uh, starting from 2030, uh, we again re reduce uh, either both supply and return temperature, and we increase the HPC cooling power. And finally, uh, up to 2050. We have a reduction of the, the grid supply uh, temperature and the grid return, and we increase again the cooling temperature. The transition uh, levels that we have, the elements that we can play with uh, on, the, on our district, district heating grid are the solar thermal collectors, so the solar panels, the CHP, how much do we use it, how much megawatt we, we produce with the CHP units, how much uh, BTES system we install, and uh, how much um, HPC cooling uh, we use. 
And uh, we can define like these strategies, uh, either the most conservative one in which we will implement uh, solar panels and uh, NBHE only at the late stage of the, of the, the transition and um, intermediate or gradual or progressive uh, immediate uh, stages in which uh, we uh, decide that we will implement these elements, uh, like the, the clean elements as solar, solar thermal collectors and BTES as soon as possible. And then we compare the emission factor and uh, the, um, uh, the cost analysis of, uh, of this, uh, these different scenarios, uh, having in mind the goal of the emission target uh, reduction to, to reduce it uh, below 100, uh, 100 gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and by keeping the cost as low as possible. The immediate transition in 2050 uh, 2025, sorry, is quite ex expensive. We, we reduce the emission targets, so that's a, a primary goal that is achieved, but we have a quite a high uh, LO, LCOH. Uh, with the conservative strategy, we miss the target. We don't have, uh, we don't have enough, uh, we, don't, we have still too much CO2 uh, emissions. The step transition in 2030 is not the most efficient. Okay, we reduce the price compared to the immediate transition, but it's still, uh, it's still quite expensive. Progressive strategy with a maximum system of 2030 shows that we have the lowest emission. So in terms of uh, climate change impact, this is the best scenario, but still we have quite a high cost uh, to be, to be uh, sustained. And actually the best strategy uh, in which we achieve uh, the emission target and that is the, the, the least expensive of the, of the goal achieving strategies is the gradual strategy in which uh, we are uh, best adapted to the boundary condition changes of, uh, of prices of the market and is the most efficient uh, to implement such system. So the recommended strategy based on the elements of our heating grid and, uh, and the implemented uh, variables is that we start uh, with a solar, solar thermal collector surface in 2025, uh, with no BTS implemented yet, the CHP would be at three um, megawatt in terms of thermal production, and we still use the, the, the heat potential as return. In 2030, we increase the solar thermal collector surface. We implement right away 19 uh, borehole uh, heat exchanger. We reduce the CHP to 1.5. And uh, we uh, use the, H, the, the, the high capacity uh, computer as the supply line. And in 2040, uh, the solar collector surface increases uh, again. We also increase the number of BTS system and we reduce the CHP and uh, the, the HPC uh, directly as a, as a supply. What uh, the, the outcome of these pre-feasibility studies and cost analysis shows us that we have uh, MDBTS suitable for a seasonal heat storage. We also, uh, with M MDBTS, significantly reduce the thermal impact on near surface aquifer, which is important when these near surface aquifers are used for uh, drinking water and so on. And also, uh, MDBTS are cost efficient and can significantly reduce green gas emissions. But as I mentioned, the proof of technical feasibility has not yet been established. And thus, we implement in, uh, in Darmstadt demo sites, uh, schools for seasonal uh, thermal uh, storage in medium deep uh, crystalline basement. And so, <coughs> sorry, this, go this project has several goals. First of all, we want to uh, build a demonstrator on a technical scale of four of these deep borehole heat exchanger wells with a spacing approaching five meters as designed and as suggested by the numerical uh, uh, best, uh, best plan. We want also to demonstrate the hydraulic down the hole hammer drilling to reduce the costs of, uh, of such, uh, such systems. Uh, the goal will be mainly also to characterize experimentally the operation of charge and discharge of such a medium deep system to calibrate and validate the numerical model that I, present, I presented before also the, the subsurface model of the, of the, the crystalline uh, reservoirs, which is, uh, of course, a, a good asset for 
storage, but also for, for geothermal, uh, geothermal uh, reservoir, because these are the similar reservoirs in terms of lithology and of, uh, of subsurface structures, such as fracture networks and so on. Uh, the, the, another aspect that uh, we aim with KU's project is also the economic and emission prediction of highly scaled plan and evaluation of the integration of the MDBTS into energy concept and energy transition of, uh, of the university. And of course, the, to develop a geophysical uh, 4D exploration methodology for crystalline reservoir system, which can benefit not only for heat storage purposes, but for all subsurface applications that uh, are dealing with such type of, uh, of lithologies. This consortium, uh, this project is, uh, is also, uh, we have numerous partners, uh, the University of Darmstadt with the, the Department of uh, Applied Geothermy, and we are uh, involved with uh, so drill, drilling companies, um, logging companies, and so on. And uh, it, so it's not a, a small project, and it will, in the coming years, uh, bring a lot of, uh, of insights on, on the behavior of uh, of crystalline rocks uh, for for thermal uh, for thermal heat, uh, for thermal energy storage. We also implemented uh, geophysical surveys, so we have uh, 2D seismic lines uh, to image the, the subsurface and the the, the crystalline rocks uh, to be able to assess uh, the thickness of the, the surface aquifer in the in the weathered zone and uh, the the potential fracture network of the of the crystalline rock. We also performed the geoelectric profiling to, again here, characterize the, the crystalline, uh, the crystalline top, uh, top horizon, and uh, some gravimetry, or again here to, to identify the, the heterogeneity of, uh, of our subsurface reservoir, and some radon emission measurements to detect, if any, uh, potential uh, leaking, uh, leaking uh, areas. So this, this this project uh, will be uh, will be structured in different work packages. We have the first aspect that is the construction of the plant with drilling sites, so groundwater monitoring, uh, the drilling of the medium deep boreholes, installation of the pipes and so on. A strong experimental uh, approach with a, a big uh, data collection on, uh, on geoscience and civil engineering from geophysical investigation, as I mentioned, hydrogeological and hydrochemical monitoring. Uh, drilling data uh, will be also available and also uh, what is of the main interest to see if such a uh, project can be uh, economically uh, viable or at the cost data. Experimental operation will focus on uh, the simulation of charge and discharge cycle and the monitoring of the reservoir behavior. And uh, all of this uh, experimental uh, data will be used uh, in the numerical modeling and system assessment to develop and parameterize the models. Uh, to validate them and to propose upscaling and economic and environmental evaluation of such, uh, such concepts. As I mentioned, uh, we have a, a strong numerical modeling uh, approach in which we implement the geophysical and geoscientific data and the monitoring data in an iterative loop to validate and calibrate the model and to parameterize eventually uh, critical, uh, critical aspects to move towards uh, the upscaling and the evaluation of uh, such large-scale systems. Currently, uh, we are in the beginning of the project. Uh, we are in the approval and implementation planning. And if everything goes uh, smooth and fine, we should uh, start to drill in the next, in the next month with the, with the groundwater uh, monitoring wells. So to conclude, um, here we, we presented several uh, uh, research and several work that has, have been done on the heat, uh, heat storage possibilities uh, through a medium deep uh, borehole thermal heat exchanger. So it's clear that we can integrate uh, renewable heat sources uh, in the district heating networks, but for this we need a possibility to store this heat. Uh, one possibility is to store it in the subsurface. A good potential candidate uh, for heat storage in the subsurface are crystalline rocks in which we can implement medium deep uh, borehole thermal exchanger. And this has a good potential to improve the district heating network sustainability. Uh, of course, MDBTES can be included in the strategy here of the university heat transition and example 
of uh, other potential e-transition of um, of district or of neighborhoods uh, towards a cleaner and uh, less CO2 emissions uh, in uh, in heating grids. And uh, the democide schools will provide in the next year a fundamental basis for planning and a proof of concept for medium deep uh, BTES uh, system. So I would like to thank you all for, for your attention today. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to contact me uh, or uh, ask the questions right away in the chat. Uh, right now. So thank you very much, everyone.